Good to see all y'all this morning. Amen. All right, we are going to continue our walk through Ephesians. If you have your Bibles, flip on over to Ephesians chapter 4. That's where we're going to be. Um, before she leaves, I would like to also say happy anniversary to my lovely wife. So don't go anywhere. Everyone look if I could say, aww. 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 Right. 70 wonderful years with that woman. Wow. <laughs> yep. We age really well. <laughs> All right. So we're going to be in, okay, she's pointing to my bald spots. Now that was just rude. <laughs> wow. You would point to my bald spots. Now I'm really conscientious to even put my head down because then you guys can see even more. All right, so uh, Ephesians chapter 4, that's where we're going to be this morning <clears throat> on this fine Father's Day on my sixth anniversary. I'm really curious. And uh, we're going to be covering a lot of ground this morning, even conceptually. We're going to be talking a lot of um, some of the just deep, beautiful concepts that Ephesians 4 has to offer. It's just, this stuff is just absolutely essential to church life, to what we do as a church. Um, we're going to just be in four verses, Ephesians chapter 4, 7 through 10. That's where we're going to be today. I'll go ahead and read those. Ephesians 4, 7 through 10 says this. <clears throat> but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And you a quick, simple reading of the book of Ephesians, this is one of those things that just kind of uh, disappears. This is one of those things that we just glance over. What is going on? He ascended, he descended. It just, just kind of seems logical that this is what, what would happen here. I will gloss over that, but there is an immensely important lesson, multiple lessons, honestly, we learn in these three, four verses. All right, but all we're, where we're going this morning is, is two simple points, and it's going to cover a lot, but two simple points that I want us to see this morning. Right, one, the first one we're going to talk about is the good news of grace gifts. All right, don't be overwhelmed by that. We're going to explain all of that. The good news of grace gifts. And then the second point we're going to be talking about is the good news of the grace giver. Okay, so that's where we're headed. The good news of grace gifts and the good news of the grace giver. All right, so immediately when we jump into this passage, the first two words, they, they, they expose us to one of the, the most valuable truths in, in all of Christianity, essential to the gospel. What is it? You guys see that verse 7 in, in ESV, different uh, translations. We're going to put this in different places within this phrase. But the first two words, you guys see that there? But grace. But grace. Grace. Now, grace is showing up on the scene, and Paul is going to tell us a little bit about it. There's something unique about this word, grace. Whenever it's used with this little Greek article in front of it, uh, which we can't see in English, it means a, a certain aspect of that grace. Okay, So a certain aspect of that grace is, is being discussed. All right, now, while we can say that salvation is the gift of God, it is by grace through faith alone, we can't see that that is absolutely true. That's not the kind of grace that's being discussed here. That's not the specific type of grace being talked about. It's not even talking about common grace that falls on where, where God, the rain, God's rain falls on the just and the unjust and, and, and where God does good to, to a certain degree to everyone who's alive, the very fact that they're alive. So it, it's not salvific grace. And if it was, it would follow it with a statement like this, the grace of God has led you to repentance. It's not common grace, or it would, it would follow up with a statement like this, God says rain fall on the righteous and the unrighteous, the just and the unjust. But this statement, when he says, but grace, all right, that comes off of the heels of a call to action directed at Christians. So you guys remember this from a couple weeks ago. The call to action is what? Just shout it out there. It's back in verse 1 of chapter 4. All right, so this is a kind of grace that God is, is, is that Paul's discussing 
in right on the heels of a call to action. What's the call to action? Verse worthy. one. Walk worthy. Okay, so this is in the context of walking worthy, of bringing your life into balance with your position in Jesus. Okay, so walk worthy. Right after he talks about that idea of walking worthy, then he says, but grace. But grace. So what we know then by, by this, this, the context and the placement of this, this word grace is that this is a discussion of enabling grace. Okay, the kind of grace that empowers people, empowers Christians to be who God wants them to be. This is the enabling grace of God. It comes right after we're given this command to walk worthy. Well, how can we walk worthy? We walk in humility, gentleness, patience, bearing one with one another. How do we do that? How can I live the, God, the life God wants me to live? How can I do that? We do it by the enabling grace of God. But grace. And so that's why he follows up walking worthy in, in humility and gentleness and patience, forbearing with one another, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. That's why he follows that up with grace. Because there is enabling grace of God that enables, empowers, allows us to be the types of people God wants us to be. Okay, so. Uh, John Piper says this about grace in this specific way. He says, grace is not simply leniency when we have sinned. Grace is the enabling gift and power of God not to sin. Grace is power, not just pardon. Remember what we were singing about just a few minutes ago? Grace is pardon. It's only by the grace of God. You take the grace of God out of your, your soul and you got nothing. You are bankrupt. But the grace of God is, yes, pardon, but it's also power. He goes on to say, this is plain, for example, in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. Paul describes grace as the enabling power of his work. It's not simply the pardon of his sins. It's the power to press on in obedience. He, Paul says, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Therefore, the effort we make to obey God is not an effort done in our own strength, but by the strength that God supplies in order that, every, that in everything God may be glorified. All right, so grace, this is an enabling grace that gives us power to walk the Christian life. God says, I want you to walk worthy, but I'm going to provide a way to do that. I'm going to come alongside you and I'm going to enable you through grace to do just what I'm asking you to do. You may not see it where you're sitting right now, or you're sensing in the week that you just had. You may not understand how your life is going to change and how you can ever, ever do what God is calling you to do. You may be sitting there and be like, you know how impatient I am? You know how rude I am to my spouse? You know how proud a person I am if we're just going to be completely honest in the, in the silence of my own mind? Do you know how hard that's going to be to see that type of person become a, a humble team player? Do you know how hard that's going to be, God? Do you know what this looks like in my life? But God says, I have provided a way and it's called grace. You have my unmerited favor resting on you. So you have access to all the power you need. It's given to us this grace. And that's exactly the next phrase that he brings up here. But grace. Now what about this enabling grace is he specifically talking about? But grace was given. Do you see that? Grace was given to each one of us. So now grace is being donated. It's being gifted to us. And the cool thing about that verb, you don't have to look too hard, is to see that we are passive. We're the passive element in what's going on there. This is called a divine passive where God is the enabler, where God is the one giving. We're not a part of of the giving, we receive the giving of, of a powerful almighty God. And so that emphasizes that the individual receives this gift of enabling grace, this gift of enablement from the Lord, and now we're to use that to minister for his glory. Now we're to use that enabling grace that he's given us, that was by God himself given to us, we use that now for our good and his glory. To love the people around you, the Christians in your church, in your local body, to, to serve them. We now take that what was given and pass it on. Pay it forward. It was 
given. The cool thing about grace, if you think about it, is it can only be given. Grace can only be given. It can only be donated. It can, it, think about it, it can't be purchased. Because if you are purchasing grace, that's kind of like keeping up, keeping up. I, I'm trying to keep up. I want, I want what everyone else has. I'm gonna just, just, if I can just buy this, and I can keep up with it with everyone else. If it could be earned, which it cannot be, then that's called, that's called sucking up, right? Where you're trying to earn someone's grace. You're trying to, to be good enough. You're trying to get this favor from someone. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't purchase it. You can't even steal grace. If you steal grace, that's called getting locked up. You can't steal grace either. Grace has to be given. Grace has to be given. No strings attached. It's actually called love. There's nothing going on with grace except the essence of the person giving it is being exposed. The one giving grace is, is, is being, is showing their heart. And we see the heart of God in that he gives grace. There's no way else to get it. It is just given. And then he goes on and says it's given to each one of us. All right, so now we see what was given. The grace. And here he says, this is who it's given to. Each one of us. Us being Christians. Us being those who, are, who believe. Those who are believers. Those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. He is, the, the emphasis here is on, on each. Okay, so what's going on here is in this passage of unity. Where Paul brings out this idea of us. We walk together. And in following these, these th four verses, he goes back to this idea of us being together, being the church. And he takes a brief pause to see where the individual fits into the group, to see this diversity within unity. So this is, this is a brief step back from the unity of the group and, and, and walking together. And now Paul is speaking directly when he says each one of us. He's speaking directly to the beauty of diversity within harmony. Think about a song. Think about a song, how uh, there, there is a, a normally a melody, and that's what people get caught in their, their brains and their minds, and what they, they rehearse in their heads. It's the, normally the melody of a song, right? Remember the, the, the main thing, and so the song has this one melody that we all know, we all sing out, yet there's also harmony. And when we sing harmony, the song doesn't weaken, the song is actually enriched when we sing harmony. When the diverse notes are sung together, the song becomes more powerful. The songs become beautiful. And James, I actually want you guys, if you want to hit play in a second, I, I want us to see this, okay? I want us to see this idea where actually our diversity works in unity. Is this going to work? We're not going to watch all five minutes. Let's go, my soul. Oh, my soul. So we all know this song, right? So he's singing four different parts. That's fine. You can pause it there. All right, now we look at that. What's going on? We all know that song, right? We sing that song in church. We, we know the melody really well. But there are four parts to that song. There's four different notes being sung. And, and when you heard that, I'm seeing some of your faces that were like, that was really good. We thought that was like, that was pretty good, right? That was acapella. That was really good. That's what's going on here where Paul takes a moment and he says, all right, we have this, this diversity within unity and it does not weaken us. It does not weaken us. It actually makes us stronger by understanding where the, the part of the whole and how that all works together. And realizing that each one of us, as the individual, has been given grace, has been given these different gifts that we're about to discuss. And it's for the sake of the gospel, the glory of God, but it is for the sake of one another. Being different is actually a good thing when it is put to use properly. All right, so grace has been given to each one of us. If we keep moving along here, it says, according to the measure of Christ's gift. According to the measure of Christ's gift. So now we're seeing a little bit more about what's happening here. These gifts, 
Now, the, these gifts of Christ, they are measured out by an all-knowing, all-loving, all-wise God. I want us to zoom in on this idea of, of measure, okay? So in the words of uh, uh, Tim Lovegrove, a friend of mine, a pastor of mine, he, pastor friend of mine, he says this, Christ measured out to you a certain amount of grace as a gift. He has allotted to each person a measure of faith. And normally when we think of gifts, we think of we either have it or you don't have it. But a wise and sovereign God gives gifts, yes, and he gives them in the right measure. These gifts are given, they are grace gifts given by Jesus. They are measured out by the one giving them. They are measured out by the one giving them. Now that's one thing if I'm the one measuring it. You know, this, this guy Ben, if I'm measuring out the gifts, I'm going to get it wrong. I don't know all of you guys to the degree that I need to know you. I should not be in charge of measuring out how much of a gift you guys get. Jesus, however, is the all-knowing, all-wise God who has, has watched you live your life, the, your entire life, the last seven days, think about that. God has, has watched you, he's been there as you live your life. That God who knows exactly how you think, what you like and what you don't, what you're skilled at and what you're not skilled at, and he's the one who is measuring out the gifts for you. That's pretty cool. You guys know what that means then? Of Jesus himself, guys, I'm not making this up, this is, this is in verse 7. Jesus himself is measuring out the gifts for you. You know what this means? This means he has tailor-made gifts for you. This means he doesn't make mistakes. This means that he doesn't let any of you slip through the cracks. They're given by Jesus, so that also means there's no room for jealousy. There's no room to look across the, the, the room and say, oh man, I wish I would have had that administrative gift. I just said, why didn't I get that, Jesus? Why didn't you measure that out to me? There's no room for that. You have been uniquely designed, you've been uniquely gifted with the gifts that Jesus has given you. Do you not trust that he's going to get it right? Do you not trust that Jesus is going to absolutely nail it when it comes to you and what he gives you? You can't look across the room and man, I can't believe that Jason guy, whoever. I just can't believe him. Why, why does he have to be the leader? Why can't I be the leader? Take that off with Jesus. Stop being jealous. Stop complaining about who God has designed you to be. Take it up on it. But Jesus himself has gifted us all as believers, all those who believe with this unique this, this tailored set of gifts that they're designed to fit perfectly together, just as we just watched the different parts in a song and how they work together beautifully, that is exactly what Jesus is doing. He's fitting us together with other Christians that build up the church, that build up his body. This is absolutely beautiful. We have to understand this, where we're headed with this. And, and how we're going to use our gifts and, and, and what exactly this looks like is really going to hopefully blow our minds and reset us around the gospel and growing together. But you might remember at this stage, I said the first point was what? The good news of grace gifts. Okay, so we've talked about these grace gifts that have been given to each one of us. They've been, they've been measured out. They've been measured out perfectly for, for you, for me. They've been measured by Jesus himself. But here's the question then. Why is that good news? Then why is that exciting that Jesus has done that? You guys got to remember in verse 1, guys, we are being asked to do things we are not good at. We're being asked to walk humbly, to be patient, to maintain unity, to be gentle, to forbear with one another. Guys, we are being asked for, to, to do some difficult things if God wasn't in the equation. You look at me and say, I, I just don't, I don't see it. I don't see it, God. This is, really, this is work. This is really hard. What, what, what's going on? What this, this is really good news because this is God's way of saying, no, no there is a way to be who I want you to be. This is God saying, no, no, there is this thing called enabling 
grace, well, I'm, where I'm not going to ask you to be something that I, in myself and in my beauty, do not enable you, do not empower you, do not make you to be. <clears throat> this is awesome. In those moments of weakness, in those moments of confusion, in those moments of discouragement, of frustration, there's grace. There's the enabling grace of God. The grace of God is there to see you through. The grace of God is given to you. Romans 14, 4 says, The Lord, Jesus, is able to make you stand. So don't sit there and recoil back thinking that I'm not good enough. Don't, don't, don't sit there and think, I'm not gifted enough. Jesus, you got it wrong with me. You really missed the mark when it came to me. You don't know me, Jesus. Don't sit there with that type of mindset in, in, in confusion or whatever it is and think, well, I just don't know what my role is. No, no. Give the grace of God. Now go. You have the grace of God. Go. You have been given these gifts, not just to sit inside of you and to percolate inside of you. You've been given gifts then to be administered to the body. Go! This is what I mean when I talk about a gift. Because there's a lot of confusion. And in the Greek, there's actually two words for, Greek, uh, for gift. One is charisma, which gets a lot of people messed up. And one is dormia, which is the one that actually is used in this passage. All right, and this is just a, what I mean by gift, okay, is I'm borrowing this from another pastor, is a unique ministry ability. Put that in your phone, write it down, etch it on your brain. When we talk about gifts, it is a unique ministry ability. That's all we mean by that, okay? A unique ministry ability. If we were to take one of you guys this morning, and actually we're going to do this, Paco, come on. This just hit me, and we're just going to do it, all right? Why don't you just plant yourself right there, okay? <clears throat> so this is Paco. Some of you guys are rolling eyes at what they're going to do. This is Paco, all right? And what we're going to do is we're going to sit down with Paco, and we as a group are going to figure out a unique ministry ability that Paco has. All right? This is 20 questions. Kind of. <laughs> I've I have not thought this through. We're just going to see where God takes us, all right? So, Paco, we all know Paco. We all love Paco. So let's just ask Paco some simple questions, all right? So, Paco, <clears throat> um, so obviously you've been coming to our church for a while, and you're also gone for a while. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> Paco likes to travel the world. Um, <clears throat> but, Paco, what do you think? Actually, now let's come to me. What do you think you could bring to the, quote, table of Gospel Life, Gospel Life Church? Uh. <laughs> so let's take what Paco's good at. You guys know, what is Paco good at? Good looks. Needs some help. <laughs> He's obviously ruggedly handsome. Yes. <laughs> what else about, what do we know about Paco? He's action-oriented. He's action-oriented. All right. So, awesome. So, Paco, we're starting to kind of refine some stuff here. Becca, you know some stuff. What about Paco? He's always cheerful and very genuine. Yeah, he's very genuine. Paco also has a unique set of training, right, skills. So Paco is a finance guy, uh, and, and he's also an action guy. So what if we were to pair his finances with his action to be directed at other Christians? Would we not then find how that was a tailor-made way for Paco to serve you guys, to serve the church? Does that make sense? Just kind of get with me where, where I'm headed with this. This is totally unique to Paco. Now, if we were to bring Nate up, and we, we, just, we can't handle two of you guys. If we were to bring Nate up, though, we could look at Nate, and, and he's not going to fit the same filter. It's not going to be, all right, Nate is, has this, this financial backing, you know, who's got this, like, you know, all he can think of is what to do next. You might think like that, but that might not be to the degree that, that Paco has it. It's not going to work for Nate. This is Paco. This is his unique ministry ability. Because this isn't getting mystical or weird, okay? This isn't talking about, like, this some crazy spiritual gifts that I, I, I don't know. You've got to spend ten hours in prayer before God ever lets you view. This is not what we're talking about. I thank you, Papa. You're a very great example. We all love you. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome home, by the way. Um, Papa just moved a couple weeks ago to Fort Collins. We're pretty excited about that. But you all have been given a unique ministry ability. There is something about you that can be put to use for the, the, the betterment of the other Christians in your life. There's something about you. And you guys hopefully you're thinking through it. You're kind of filing through your mind and you're thinking, what, what, what is that for me? 
What is it? What's that look like in my life? How, how, how have I been, been raised? How, how have I been given uh, the, the way I was raised, the way I have been growing up, the, the experiences I have, the, the knowledge that I have, and the personality that God's gifted me with? So how do those work together to then help the church? How can I pay that forward? What does that look like? We all have a unique ministry capacity, and it is meant to be used. All right, so that's why it's good news. It's good news because we have the enabling grace of Jesus to help us be who he wants us to be. <clears throat> it's also good news because of the promise in Matthew 16, verse 18. And, and when it takes that verse, Matthew 16, 18, where, where Jesus says, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. I will build my church. It takes that promise and it brings it to life. This isn't just wishful thinking. It's a promise that Jesus is actively working out in his church. He uses us, guys. He uses us to build his church. We are going to continue through Ephesians 4. Look at verse 16. From whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. Listen to this. When each part, each, there's that word again, each one of us was given grace, enabling grace, remember? When each part is working properly, are you guys following? Do you see this in verse 16? When each part is working properly, what happens? Makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. God will build his church. He will build his church. And when you show up and when you be the church, when you are the church, you are contributing to the growth and the health of Jesus' bride. You are. This isn't just silly mantras, guys. When we talk about church growth, everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's got a book about it. Hundreds of books about church growth. And everybody's got their own ideas. But here we see it in Ephesians 4. It is that simple. We're using what God has gifted you, given you by his enabling grace, putting that to work at the, at the right time, in the right place, and in the right way, results in the body growing so that it builds itself up together in one. And if we were to go back to chapter 3, verse 21, then we see it, we see this, to him be glory in the church. To him be glory in the church. So when we as a church, and we are taking that, that unique ministry ability that, that, that Jesus himself has measured out and gifted to me, when we put that to use in the lives of our local assembly, the universal church, when we put that to use, it, it results in making the body grow in love that gives him glory. It raises high the name of Jesus. This is good news, guys. This is really good news. Each part working properly for the betterment of his church and for the glory of God. All right, so that's the good news of grace gifts. That's how God, that's how Jesus is going to build his church. Not through silly mantras, it's not through weird techniques, it's not through 10-step systems. The church grows as its members function properly. Some of you guys might, you might know what you're good at. You might know how you have been uniquely, divinely measured out this, this ability. You might know that, but you got to dust it off. You need to pull that back out. You better dust those off and put them to use, guys. Put them to use. This is one of the most valuable reasons of, of why you should come to church. Why you should be the church. The church grows by, by the grace of God and the, the insane, uh, mind-blowing thinking of God where he allows us to be his hands and feet. This is how he does it. The good news of the grace giver, guys. And this is where eight, verses 8, 9, and 10 come into play. And we see the good news of the one who gives grace. For one, if you think about grace in and of itself, which we already did, that shows us, that exposes to us the heart of Jesus. That for one, he is generous. Especially regarding 
He's gr the grace that he has and the gifts that he gives. Especially, he's just generous. The phrase we like to say around here, he ain't broke and he ain't stingy. He is a generous God. He's generous concerning gifts. And you might be sitting there thinking, man, I don't think so, God. You weren't generous to me. Close your mouth. Shut that pothole. Jesus doesn't get it wrong. He's generous concerning gifts, concerning grace. Something about the amazing grace of Jesus in contrast to human relationships. We often think, especially Christians via versus Christians, we often think that there's got to be this degree of I don't know, character that someone's got to level up to, they've got to measure up to before we let them in. That's fundamentally flawed. That's fundamentally anti-grace. Right? I'm not saying don't check your discernment when you meet someone. Don't, don't use discernment. Don't be wise in, in your friendships. We understand there are biblical principles that drive that. But we can't have our thinking go something like, man, you've got to earn. You're going to earn when I give back to you. I'm, you will not get my kindness. And, and, and I'm not going to show you that I'm actually a pretty nice, humble guy until you get to a, a certain point in our relationship or until you get close enough or until you have enough history, we have enough tenure in our relationship or whatever. As it's putting a price on your relationship with other believers. That is anti-grace. You're saying that, that my favor towards you isn't free. You've got to earn it, so get in line. Do you ever find yourself thinking that sinks itself in the way we, we live our lives? We have, there's going to be none of that. Christians versus Christians. That's not grace. That's actually earning love. That's paying for your affection. When grace in its very essence is free. But Jesus is generous with it. And he is generous towards the church. If we were to look at these next couple verses, in saying he ascended, verse 9, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? So he's not just generous with gifts and grace. He's generous towards the church. He descended and ascended for the church. The, the, the meaning of, of Christ's ascension here, it presupposes his former descent. And what happened, what, and, and his descent is traditionally accepted as his incarnation, Okay, so God becoming man in the form of Jesus is one act in which Jesus said, I'm generous towards the church. I'm giving you all of me. I'm giving you myself. Part of Jesus' generosity was in the very fact that he came to earth in the form of a, a man. And what happened to Jesus when he was a man? He didn't just stay for a little while, drink some of our, our tea and crumpets. And say some cute, some cute, some cute quips. You know, he didn't just give us some life tips, some coaching advice, and then bounce. That is not the Jesus that we see. We see a generous Jesus who lingers, who stays with his people, and so much so that after he dies a death for his people, bleeds all of his blood for his people, he actually gives his spirit. He never leaves us. He's generous towards the church. He gave it all that he had. He's generous with his own heartbeats. He gave more. So he's generous towards the church. We even know it's about Jesus. He's actually generous towards all. God, God is a, a generosity towards everyone. And you might think, well, yeah, that's kind of obvious. But if you think about secular generosity and the way that works, there's always a limit. There's always a limit. One, of, <clears throat> one name who gives more money than anyone is Bill Gates. He's given up to nearly $30 billion that he has, in his generosity, given away. But Bill Gates, and we look at that and we say, oh, yeah, that's so super generous. Like, could you, you know, pay some of that forward my way? I'm totally cool with that. You know, do some church stuff. Like, yeah, you know. So, but what's going on with, with his generosity? You know who he's never given one dollar to? Apple. He's never given any money to Apple. And you look at that, you say, of course, I'm accepting it does. There's limits. There's boundaries to his generosity. And when we see the, the, the generosity of God in giving the gospel, says, my generosity is boundless and free. 
John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. This is a huge point about the generosity of God. When humans are generous, it normally limit, we have limits, financial limits, relational limits. I could never give my relationship to a libertarian, whoever. Uh, I couldn't do that. We always have limits. But the generosity of God says, whosoever will may come. <clears throat> whosoever will may. The generosity of God says, come ye sinners, poor and needy. Weak, wounded, sick, and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love, and power. He is able, he is able, he is able. He is willing, doubt no more. That's the generosity of our Savior. So the good news of the grace giver is that our Savior is not broke and he's not stingy. The good news of our grace giver is that he is generous on all accounts. And we see this by the way he descended to this earth that he's talking about. The way he turned himself into a man, became a man, lived amongst us, died his death on the cross. We see this. This is his generosity. He just, he gave it all. But in these verses, we also see the authority with which Jesus gives gifts. All right, so we see that he is generous in giving gifts, but he also has the authority to give gifts. All right, I'm going to bring up a quick story real quick about my brother Jim. <clears throat> Love my brother Jim. Me and Jim, uh, we went to the same, same college uh, at different times, yes, but the same college, if you guys are curious, it's called Southwestern Eastern University of the Coastal Carolina School of Law and Culinary. And uh, it's just, you know, it's just a small private school, but no one probably knows it. And uh, Jim, in his time at Bob Jones, just said it, sorry. Oh. Sorry, Jim, cat's out of the bag. <clears throat> would uh, roam the halls in the evenings and give demerits to the people in his hall. You say, well, yeah, they did that all the time at Bob Jones. Yeah, they did, but Jim didn't have the authority to give those demerits out. Jim wasn't the resident advisor. He was not a dorm suit. Jim had none of that authority. And Jim would walk around with a clipboard, and he would pass out demerits. <clears throat> yes, pretty goofy. Um, but when, when, when Jim doesn't have the authority to give those gifts, of demerits out, they mean nothing. They mean nothing. And actually, the real dudes would catch him every now and then. Jim, what are you doing? Go to your room. <laughs> Fun's over. He didn't have the authority to do that. But Jesus, having descended to this earth, lived a perfect life. Jesus, having then, after his death and his resurrection, where he proves to the world that I am who I am, who I say I am, he, he, he ascends back to the heavenlies. He ascends on high and he gives gifts to men. Jesus has the authority to give gifts. By ascending and returning, he won for himself the right to be the head of the church. He won for himself an inheritance of believers. Remember, this is, this is Ephesians lingo we have here. He won to himself us. He wanted to himself the church, Christians, those he loves and he died for. He, he won for himself all authority in heaven and, and on earth. By his resurrection, he defeated Satan, he defeated hell, he defeated death, and he won the right to give gifts as he wants. He, he won. Do you guys see that in verse 8? In your, in your Bible, it might be in quotes. When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives. He gave gifts to men. You guys see that? This is almost a direct quote from Psalm 68, verse 18. Okay? And what's going on here? We, we've got to understand Psalm 68 to understand the power of this passage. Okay, so flip on over to Psalm 68. Psalm 68. All right, I'm just going to read some excerpts about Psalm 68. <clears throat> uh, verse, I'll start in... Verse 15, O mountain of God, mountain of Bashan, 
Oh, many peaked mountain, mountain of Bashan. Why do you look with hatred, O mountain peaked mountain, at the mount that God desired for his abode? Yes, where the Lord will dwell forever. The chariots of God are twice ten thousand, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. Sinai is now in the sanctuary. And then here's the verse. You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train, and receiving gifts among men. Verse 19, blessed be the Lord who daily bears up, bears us up. God is our salvation. Verse 20, our God is a God of salvation. To God, the Lord belong deliverances from death. As this is a song of victory. This is a song of triumph, Psalm 68 is. And Paul, he doesn't do a direct quote, which is kind of unique. It's not a direct quote. There's, there's one thing different between this quote and Psalm 68, verse 18. It's, it's in the little two words, gave. And in Psalm 68, it's received. So what happens? What happened in Psalm 68 era? When, when, a, 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 when soldiers, when an army went to war, and they won the battle, they won the war, they gathered all of the spoils of war, they, they took all of the booty, and they took these things, and, and, and they would march back to their city, and, and walk through the streets, people are singing, people are, are dancing, and, and they had all of this loot, and they would deliver it to the king. They would give the king gifts where the king would receive gifts. Paul changes it in Ephesians where he says, and he gave gifts to men because he won to himself the authority to give gifts. He's triumphant in winning to himself the right to be the head of the church, the, 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 the right to, uh, to, to be the authority, the, the power in heaven and on earth. He, he won to himself the right to give gifts as he pleases. He gives gifts. And Jesus, being a generous God, has given us what we need. <clears throat> the gifts that Jesus has supplied you with have the authority of God the Father behind them. This isn't Jim walking down the halls saying, here's some for you, cut your hair, here's some for you, your shirt's on top. Oh, my shirt is on top, it's really hot, so just bear with me, okay? <laughs> this isn't Jim walking down the hall and, and giving out people who are breaking the rules. This is Jesus who has all power and authority to give whatever he wants away, he does. This is Jesus. And you can respond to that in different ways. You can receive it thankfully and say, thank you, Jesus, for making me who I am and giving me what I need. You can receive that, you can accept it and say, thank you. Or you can reject it and say, no, nope, not for me. Not for me. I know, I know, I, I think I do have a certain, certain set of skills, but I'm not going to use that here. These aren't my type, these aren't my people. No, sorry. And then you can just neglect it utterly. You need to dust it off then. You need to get it out, dust it off, and you gotta put it to use. We serve, we have been gifted by the triumphant, victorious Jesus. This is why Paul brings up this psalm of victory. In verse 8, it's a psalm of victory where Jesus is the triumphant king where God the Father looks at him and is entirely pleased and says, no, this is my well-pleased son. I'm well-pleased by my son. Here's everything. You have authority on earth and in heaven. And that Jesus who is the victor and being the great God that he is gives grace gifts. He doesn't just stockpile those spoils in his kingly warehouses. He doesn't take what he has won for himself. He doesn't put that to the side and dole it out occasionally. He gives gifts freely to his church. And all of you as believers have been gifted by grace. You have been gifted a unique ministry ability. Now go. Use it. What a God we serve, guys. The one who descended into the lower regions, the earth, there's nothing weird or mystical going on there. It's widely accepted that that simply means the grave. 
that Jesus descended so low. He came to this earth and beyond. He went into the grave for his church. The lower regions of the earth where the dead belong. Not necessarily hell, not what he's talking about, the grave. And he who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens. And he has the right to dwell there. That he might fill all things. And now Jesus is at work to fill the earth with his glory. To fill the earth with his presence. Go. Utilize your unique capacity. Put it to use. This is how, this is God's plan to grow and build up his church. I've asked you the question before. Who wants to see our church grow? Woo! Yes, you all want that. Put your unique ability to use. If you're the evangelist, you're the one who, who, who you, that's just, you get fired up about that, and you, you, you go do it. Do it. If you, if you love, love showing mercy, give some mercy, if that's your thing, then go do it. This is how God is, is, is going to use you to build his church. If you are the behind-the-scenes person, well, get behind the scenes. If you're more of like a ground-level kind of guy, you know, I'm going to help lay some foundations that... Do it! Do it! This is how God is going to grow His church. He's using us. Put it to use. Pull it out of the box. Dust it off from the shelf. Put it to use. Let God work through us and build our church. And by doing so, we will be built together. We will be unstoppable because we are backed by an unstoppable God. Put it to use, guys. Pay it for literally talking to every single one of you. None of you are the exception. Put it to use. You have been given a gift. You've been given multiple gifts of grace by Jesus himself who has measured them out and he has delivered them specially and uniquely to you. Put it to use. So what do we do with these grace gifts then? What do we do other than put it to use? Well, for one, you've got to listen. You've got to obey what the head of the church is calling you to do. All right, so what, in what way is he calling you to utilize that ministry ability? All right, so you just, for one, you've got to just listen. Accept the fact that God has gifted you and then go. Accept that fact. Also, be encouraged. By these grace gifts of Jesus. Because maybe you're sitting there today and thinking, I got nothing. Maybe you're sitting there today thinking, I'm about as empty as they come with Jesus. Well, I've got awesome news for you. Jesus and the great friend, the great Savior, the great, the, the, the great God that he is. Maybe he does, you can just pause and hear him whisper to you, not in a mystical way, my grace is sufficient for thee. Go. You can do this. I am with you now. Go. So be encouraged that Jesus gives gifts. All right? And remember, guys, this is the plan for growing and building up his church. His children will put to use the gifts that he has selected for them. And when those gifts are used at the right time, and in the right way, the result is encouragement to the saints, growth to the church, and glory to God. Put it to use. And maybe as a church we can have some fun with this. And maybe we'll find some opportunities to get together and, and just, yeah, do what we did with Pacto. And, and, and kind of walk through each other's lives. Maybe not like as a group, because that can get a little embarrassing or awkward or whatever. But we, maybe in our life groups or in our lunch groups. Uh, we can kind of walk through and be like, you know what? I don't know if you've thought about this, but I really think you are uniquely gifted in this way. And you need to put that to use. you got to use that for the betterment of the church, the growth of the church, and the glory of God. So I think we can have some fun with this. But I also hope, I hope that you guys are challenged by the good news of grace gifts. Therefore, yes, we are called to be someone Jesus wants us to be, but he's given us everything we need to be who he wants us to be. So I hope you're encouraged by the, the good news of the grace gifts, and I hope that you are encouraged 
more than that, by the good news of the grace giver. That's our Jesus. That's our Jesus. That's why we're here today. Go. Father in heaven, thank you for your church. Thank you for our church. Lord, thank you for the relationships in this room. Lord, we ask that you would grow us, that you would just use us. Lord, would you help us? Well, Lord, I don't actually know what I'm asking because here you proclaim that you do help us. So, Lord, continue to enable us to do what you want us to do. Help us to be the, yes, the individual, the, the, the believer that you want us to be. But Lord, help us to be this unified church, this unified body of believers that you want us to be, Lord. Thanks so much for dying for us. Thank you for grace that is free. And Lord, we just work here. Lord, we're, we're broken and we freely admit that to you. Would you just use it, change us, break us, make us more like yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.